Okay, so the second talk is going to be by Yarif Kafri from uh, uh, Technion uh, University, and uh, the talk is on long range influence of disorder on active systems. So, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, congratulations on the prize, on the well deserved prize. Uh, maybe my talk, in some sense, might be in a twisted way connected to self organized criticality, but this is a long stretch. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about the long range influence of disorder on active systems. Uh, essentially, I'm going to ask the textbook questions that we ask on disorder on equilibrium systems on active systems. Uh, and this is work that was done together with uh, Sungan Wu, which was a postdoc at the Technion and is now a postdoc at MIT, Dan Bendel which was a student at the Technion, wasn't impressed by my lifestyle and moved on to finance, Meran Kardar and Julian uh, Tayor. And you can find the details in these two publications. Okay, so you've had enough introductions about active matter, so I won't give you another one. Uh, I just want to set the notation in the model. So the model I'm studying is the usual overdamped active particles. They're subject to some noise from the environment, the self-propulsion in the direction U, which has some uh, randomizing uh, directions. And then there'll be some interactions either with external potentials or with other particles. Just to contrast with the previous uh, talk, I'm not rescaling any rates by the system size. So this is the generic model of active particles that people study. And if you look at a single particle, and again, I won't bore you with the details, you've heard it enough. If you look at a single particle, it's pretty boring. They have a persistent length. They move straight, uh, roughly straight on the scale of the persistent length. And on large length scale, they, pre they perform diffusion. And somehow when you made these guys interact with the environment or with each others, the simple diffusive uh, uh, motion is translated to a host of interesting phenomena which people have been exploring uh, for a long while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, uh, this simple model, and I'm going to add a quenched random potential. I want to stress that I'm putting in vanilla disorder, the simplest disorder that you could think, think of. I'm not hiding anything in the form of the disorder. The disorder is short range correlated, drawn from a bounded distribution, nothing funny, the thing that you find in a textbook on Statnik. <clears throat> And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look first at the effects of bulk disorder on these systems. And then I'm going to do something that from the point of view of equilibrium stat mech is silly. I'm going to ask what happens when you put disorder only on the boundaries. So you have active uh, particles in this room and you put disorder only on the wall. Can that affect the system? And I'm going to show that this can have non-trivial consequences. Okay, to focus my talk even more, I'm going to focus on the simplest active matter, which is scalar dry active matter. Scalar means that the only hydrodynamic flow field is the density. Okay, so all there's other works on this order for polar active matter. It's a different story, which I'm not sure is fully understood. So for the purpose of this talk, what you have to keep in mind is that if you lo look at dilute uh, scalar active matter, which is common to all dry active matter, the system looks boring. It's uniform. If you measure a two point correlation function, it decays on some short length scale, which decays roughly exponential. You know, what, what you would expect. If you go to high densities, ignoring Leticia's uh, phases, then to a first approximation, uh, you get this phase separated state that again was discussed a lot in this talk. Uh, you have motility induced phase separation. And if you measure a two point correlation function in the steady state, it decays linearly on a scale that grows with the system size. Okay, classical uh, phase separation. And this phase transition is not fully understood, but we understand a lot about this phase transition now. We can even calculate the binodals of this phase uh, transition for a cer certain class of model. Okay. So just to recap, I'm going to look at scalar active matter. It exhibits uh, motility induced phase separation and many under uh, aspects are understood. Superficially textbook phase separation. If you don't look into the details which are interesting, that's what you see. 
So I'm going to ask the classical textbook questions about this order. The first thing, you take a dilute system, you add this order into it, what happens to the exponential correlation? So naively, you put this order into a disordered system that you expect the correlation to become even shorter range. Then you can ask, what's the fate of long range order? You put this order, is the, does the system still exhibit motility induced fate separation? And then I'm going to leave a window to things that might be pecu peculiar to the fact that we're out of equilibrium. So just to remind you, in equilibrium, which is the limit of this model where you take the self propulsion to zero, you find that if you take bulk disorder, then the correlations in the homogeneous phase become are still short range. It's a very simple calculation. You find out that in Fourier space, they, they behave as a Lorentzian square. The usual correlations are Lorentzian. You get the Lorentzian square. It's a homework exercise in many stat mech books. What about uh, the fate of uh, motility induced phase separation? Well, the lower critical dimension is found by the famous Imri Ma argument to be two. Uh, Michael Eisenman showed that there's no order in two dimensions. Okay, so that's uh, what you know. A boundary disorder from the point of view of equilibrium, it's a sub-extensive correction to the free energy. Who cares? It does nothing. The phase diagram is unchanged. The correlations in the bulk and the dilute phase are unchanged. Nothing happens. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is show that this is very different. Uh, you said this is just Ising phase. Uh, so Eisenman showed that there's no phase separation in two dimensions? In two dimension, yeah. What does that mean? I mean, the uh, oh, with disorder, disorder. with oh, disorder, yes, yeah, without disorder, one plus epsilon, yes, okay, with disorder. Sorry, so all the previous slide was the effects of disorder. Okay, I'm going to show that this is very different for active systems. So, for I'm going to discuss first the results for bulk disorder. So, the first thing I'm going to show that the structure factor is generically a power law it goes as one over Q squared. So that means that you take an active system, you throw this order into it, even in the dilute phase, it becomes immediately scale-free. Okay, so that's a route to getting scale-free behavior uh, without uh, doing almost anything. Uh, what about the fate of MIPS? I'm going to argue that the lower critical dimension is four. So it's very sensitive to the pre presence of this order. So there's no phase separation below four dimensions. And then I'm going to show this is a non-equilibrium system. It develops currents. And in fact, if you do the statistic, you can calculate the statistics of the current. And if you take a loop inside the system, you can calculate the variance of the current along this loop and it grows with the length of the loop. So just to uh, highlight these results, if I take a passive system with no disorder here with attractive interaction, so it actually phase separates, I introduce this order, I get this uniform pattern with very short correlations. However, when I do the same thing for the active system, I get this scale free structure, which is frozen in space. And I'll talk about these. These are very, they're not as subtle as the usual critical correlations that we're used to. They're pretty brute force induced by the disorder. It's everywhere. I'll discuss also a local piece of disorder, okay? I'll use that. Okay, then I'm going to discuss, uh, discuss results for boundary disorder. Uh, so first of all, if you look at the density and you're not very careful, so we have disorder along this boundary. If, you're not, if you don't look very closely, you see that there's some structure along the wall, nothing in the bulk, which is what you would expect in equilibrium. However, if you look more closely, you find out that there's density modulations that spread deep into the bulk of the system and spread on a length scale that's much larger than in any typical length scale in the system, specifically the persistent length of these active particles or the correlation length of the disorder. And they spread at these tongues that spread into the system. And you can calculate the two point correlation function, which now depends on the distance from the wall, the two densities and the normal directions. And you find out that it decays as a Lorentzian with a scale set by the distance from the wall, which is roughly these tongues. 
if you look at currents here i'm plotting the currents along along the y direction you find out again if you don't look too carefully there's some structure along the walls but if you look more carefully you find out that there's these again this is a current along the y direction you find out that there's these vortices that spread as you go deep into the system with a magnitude that's going down and in fact the scale of the vortex decreases linearly with a distance from the wall the most surprising feature from my point of view is that it's enough to kill MIPS in the dimensions three and below. So you put this order on the boundary and you change the phase diagram of the model, which is very different than what we know. And this has the consequence that when you look at active systems, I mean, that's what we all do. We look at the periodic boundary conditions, we put it in a box, but you have to be more careful because boundaries can actually change the phase diagram of the model. So just to illustrate this, this is again an equilibrium system. We put repulsive disorder potentials along the wall just to leave, not to have a bit of wetting along the walls. You can see that nothing happens except for some depletion along the walls. When you do this for the active system, the phase separation, you add disorder along the boundaries, it breaks up and there's these clumps of cyanide side which are along the wall. And again, you can understand these from the two point correlations that I showed you. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm going to show you a methodology that we've been developing for the last few years to tackle this problem. And what I'm going to do is first, first consider one localized clump of disorder in the system. I'll show that this alone uh, has a long range influence on the system. Then I'm going to take a dilute system, a di dilute system of these clumps. And then I'm going to describe the interacting system using field theory which turns out to be very very simple just lucky sometimes you're lucky you don't have to sweat your field theory. and then i probably won't have time if i have time i probably ran too fast uh, but i'm going to flash the results for boundary disorder the methodology is exactly the same okay just calculations are slightly different okay so bulk disorder and again you can find out more details here so the first thing I'm going to consider is what happens when you throw a small clump of disorder inside an active system. So, uh, so if you throw a, a clump of disorder, it's generally going to look like some asymmetric object. And what I've drawn here is this horseshoe shape just so it makes my story easier. But as long as it's asymmetric, it doesn't change anything at all. Now, if you put an asymmetric object inside a system that breaks time reversal symmetry. We know for a very, very long time, this is a ratchet, that this induces currents in the system. Okay, that's how ratchet works. Okay, and in this system, it's actually easy to understand. You have these active particles. If a particle comes from the right, it hits the potential and just slides to the left. On the contrary, if a particle comes from the left, it hits the potential inside, and it just keeps on pushing against it. So they get trapped inside the center of this potential. So this means that the active fluid is exerting a force on this potential. Newton tells us that that means that there's a force exerted on the active fluid in return. Okay, so essentially when you put an asymmetric object inside an active fluid, you get a force, localized force acting on the active fluid. So uh, the effect of uh, asymmetric potential is essentially like a pump acting on a diffusive system. So if I look at this whole thing in the, on large scales, the system is diffusive. So if I look at the far field, there's a localized pump acting on the fluid. So I'm giving you a heuristic arguments, but you could do the, uh, the calculation starting from microscopics and show that this is indeed the case. Okay, so we have a pump inside a diffusive uh, system. So uh, th that's easy to understand how it behaves. You write the divergence of the current, that they, we have the diffusive behavior uh, far away from the potential, and then we have the localized pump. We know this equation for under, from undergraduate studies or high school, depending how pretty you are. And in two dimension, the density looks like the potential of a dipole. And the, the so, sort of striking effect that it's non-local in contrast to equilibrium where you put the potential it affects the correlation length away here you get a 
effect that decays is a power law into the system. The current is given, it's a diffusive system. So the current you get by a gradient, it looks like the field of an electric dipole, which is what you would guess. You're putting the particles locally. They have to flow like this. I mean, what else could they do? <clears throat> okay, so with this, there's a few, uh, so, okay, sorry, I skipped. <clears throat> Okay, so, so, okay. Okay, so just to uh, recap, uh, I put a pump inside, I, I put an asymmetric object inside an active fluid, I get parallel correlations. This leads to long range density modulations. It's a non local function of the potential of the density profile. And again, you can derive this from microscopics, both for non interacting, which was done here, and for pairwise interacting particles, which was done in the work two years later. Okay. This is a good point to stop and make some comment. First, uh, I've argued that in the far field, this problem is directly equivalent to a pump acting in a diffusive system. This is a problem that David discussed uh, two days ago, I think, the, of work that he did with Tridib and Satya a while ago. And if we, you couple a localized force or conserved quantity, we know for ages that it generates a long range in. So from the point of view of fluid dynamics, the result that they obtained back then is like the stock slit of a diffusive fluid. Okay, you localized force and it influences everything. It's just because you couple to a conserved quantity. If I look at an object at equilibrium and I place it inside a fluid, the only force that can act on it if I look at the far field is comes from gradients of density. Here, there's a new vector that appears because of the ratchet effect, which is the force that this potential exerts on the active fluid. And we've been playing a lot with this vector over, over recent years. Once you think about this in this way, you can guess the result because you want to know what the density is away from the object. You have a vector, which is P. You want to contract it and create a scalar. The only other vector is the distance from the object. And one over R to the G is just the geometry, nothing more than that. <clears throat> Interesting enough, in, enough, we showed that P also changes dynamical exponents. I'm not going to discuss that. If you want, you could ask me or look at this paper. Okay, so now I'm going to use these results to look at the disordered problem. So again, just to recap, we have these active particles in the pre presence of uh, potential and the potential is short range correlated and bounded. Okay, so now let's look at the problem. We have our system. Sorry, somehow my computer is slow. Uh, and you put uh, one localized potential, which acts as a pump. You put another localized potential, which acts as a pump. You keep on doing this. And essentially you have a diffusive medium, which is subject to these random forcings from the pump. Now this, uh, if you've been enough in stat mech, <laughs> You know that this for the single particle problem is, is something that was studied a lot in the 80s. It goes under the name of, uh, of, uh, of Brownian particles subject to a random forcing potential. There's, uh, it started with work by Sinai, a bunch of beautiful results by Bernard Derrida on what happens in one dimension, uh, which leads to a lot of anomalous features. Uh, Daniel Fisher looked at the RG and general dimensions and already in 1990, there was a review summarizing many of the insights by uh, Pierre, Pierre Ledoussal, Jean-Philippe uh, Jean Bouchot and co-workers, yes. Order one, always, okay. Basis square root of effective potential, but the potential that I'm putting in microscopically mm -hmm. is just vanilla disorder. You generate this effective D potentials by these the ratchet effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the disorder that that's on like... the surface is just the boring disorder that you could, most boring disorder that you could imagine. It generates because of the activity an effective potential, which is much more complicated. I'll discuss this. Okay. Okay, so, so what we're doing is the many body version of the random forcing problem, which somehow active problems have made relevant. <clears throat> okay, so the simplest thing to do is to take the result for a single localized uh, potential disorder 
and then just assume that you're drawing for a random distribution of pumps inside the system. I'm being slightly sloppy here because you have to take a distribution of pumps. Doesn't matter. You do the calculation, you get that the two point correlation function is uh, one over Q squared. This is for dilute systems, no interactions whatsoever. I want to stress that the two point correlation function is really just rho of x, rho of zero. Okay, so the angular are averages over uh, histories if you want, and the overline is the average over the sort. Sorry? So this is a disorder average of the, par of the product of averages over histories. Okay, so it's not subtle correlations, it's really brute force mechanism. Yes. Sorry? Chi square is just the, this guy, the strength of the, the variance of the strength of the random portion. Well, we know that it's there. We don't know its magnitude. That's a very hard problem to calculate exactly, but it's there if you have an asymmetry. Please use the mic. No, this is for the recording, otherwise. No, uh, I mean, we could come back to this question later, but I'm saying, I mean, you are formulating a theory, but if you do not have the knowledge of chi square, I mean, so, I mean, how do you really formulate it? I mean, that is my question. I mean, unless you calculate it. If, uh, if I calculate it, so I have to specify a very specific microscopic model. Right. I have to do all these calculations. It's a number, five. Oh, it's a number, right. Five. Fine. As long as it's not zero, we're good. Okay. Uh, okay, so just to show you numerics of this thing. Uh, the, so this is just a verification. This is without disorder, it's these exponential correlations. With disorder in two dimensions, you get the logarithmic correlation function. And this is a simulation. And what you see, I mean, it's a bit, my, my computer is slow. But you see that you have fluctuations around a, for, a format that's frozen in space and has this scale free structure. Okay, so it's a, okay, the movie, that's why. Okay, but it's frozen in space and phase free and, and, and scale free. Yeah. The correlation of the random forcing. So we assume here that it's just randomly distributed. I see. No correlations in space. I mean, on large length scales, no correlations in space. So it's just delta function quenched in space. Thanks. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how we treat the interacting systems. And again, we just write the simplest linear field theory that, that we can do, do, get the results, and then we check when the uh, theory is self consistent so to write down the field theory, we have a conserved density. So we write down a conservation equation, and then we write the simplest form for the current. This shouldn't be taken seriously as a chemical potential, but just that's easy for me at least to think about it as a chemical potential. You write down the simplest form that's consistent with the symmetries of the system. And then we add first the random forcing, which is delta correlated and quenched in space. And then you add the, some noise that comes from the environment. And again, this is the important guy. This is the random forcing that generates all these interesting effects. And you can use this to study the density and current in the system. And it's a linear field theory. So, you know, everything's straightforward from the point of view of calculations. You calculate the two-point correlation functions, and you find out, this is the important result, that the leading order behavior is exactly the same as the heuristic dilute picture that I gave you before. Okay, so at least within this linear picture, uh, uh, the, the interactions don't do a lot, and I'll discuss about this a, a bit later. So, Yari, just, can you just go back to the equation? I, I, there's something I missed clearly. Uh, where is the fact that it's active? It's in the in the random in the. So, in, in principle, in the activity F will only come in, in nonlinear terms. But I'm going to argue that they're not important. Oh, sorry, sir. Your point is that. 
the random obstacles yeah to generate a force drivings because that's what's hiding okay, the activity right. the random forcing in principle the field itself will have terms but these will not be important so the important thing is that instead of putting a potential here you have to put a force that's the major uh, novelty in this field here <clears throat> okay so uh so why a power law and uh and sort of uh you, you know when you have a, a trick that you a new trick that you find you hammer it all over uh, so you do a Helmholtz decomposition those of you who remember the beach talk so you take this uh, current you have uh, this random forcing and you do a Helmholtz decomposition to this random forcing and it has a term that's a gradient of potential and it has a term that's very important for the current but it's not important for the density because its divergence is zero and if you do the, the statistics of the, uh, okay, and I should give credit here because I gave this talk a while back and, uh, and Al uh, emailed me that actually this trick was first introduced uh, by him in a paper in 2004 for linear driven systems uh, and then elaborated in this, I don't know if you can read it on this paper from 2005 with uh, Paulus where they look, use this trick to analyze driven systems. Okay, so you use this trick and you uh, use the statistics of the random force F and what you find out that the effective potential that the particles are sitting in is just a Gaussian surface. It has one over Q squared correlations. So effectively, what we have is that a Gaussian surface is trapping the particles. And all the effect is that they're being dragged essentially by this ratchet currents into deep wells and they're getting stuck inside these deep wells. And these deep wells are so large that essentially they overcome everything in the system. All the other physics becomes irrelevant. So to do make this statement uh, more precise, you do a self-consistent check. Uh, the first thing that you find that in two dimension, there actually should be a length scale L star uh, beyond which you expect the theory to break down. We couldn't see it numerically. And Sungan, oh, you know, this guy, works and he doesn't stop and he couldn't find anything beyond the one over q square correlations but we expect something to appear there i could guess what the calculation that needs to be done is i don't know how to do it so if you want we can talk about it later uh in dimensions larger than two and lo as long as we have weak disorder the theory is self-consistent maybe there's something different for strong disorder we haven't seen anything like that but we haven't played with three dimension numeric at all okay what about currents uh, I, I'm going to sort of just flash the result you can take the field theory it's straightforward to look at statistics of currents and again if you take a loop of length c inside the system you find out that the variance of the current along the loop just grows linearly with the length of the loop and the, these are numeric statistics different. so next uh, what are the effects on long range order well the theory is linear we have a potential with this funny statistics. It looks like an equilibrium theory. We might as well do an Inrima argument. Okay, everything looks like standard textbook stat mech. So you do an Inrima argument, just compare the contribution from the surface tension and the bulk disorder. It's these deep wells, and you find out that you kill MIPS below four dimensions. Okay, so asymptotically, if you have disorder in the system, you don't expect MIPS below four dimensions. And this is again a movie you take a phase separated system uh, and you add this order into the system and it evolves into this uh, self uh, similar structure yeah i mean do you see this log t square kind of thing in some quantities like the way you see it in sinai model so in one dimension uh, i'm not discussing the one dimension that's work that we did before in one dimension, you see this for a single particle. Uh, uh, in higher dimensions, you know, there's some small log corrections to the diffusive behavior. Uh, you know, we were hoping that there's something interesting. We ran some numerics to see if there's any point in spending a lot of time. We didn't see anything interesting, but maybe we didn't look enough. Yeah. Okay. So all these interesting physics of random forcing, they're really limited to one dimension. I think uh, Jean-Marc Luc did one plus epsilon dimension. 
actually, okay, so, sorry, I take it back because they're below two dimensions, you start seeing them. Okay, so now I'm going to do the silly problem in this last five minutes. So it's going to be quick. I'm going to put this order on the boundaries, which again, from an equilibrium point of view is silly, but here we're actually driving the system. It's like a bunch of pumps along the wall. <clears throat> so again, what you have to do is first solve for a single uh, bump on, a, on a, a flat wall. Again, the methodology is solve for a single clump of disorder, then use that to understand the full disorder. So you sol solve for a single clump of disorder along the wall. It's one of these annoying problems that you can guess the result from the moment you look at it. It has to be just a dipole pointing in the direction parallel to the wall because you can't drive the current normal to the wall. But actually, because it's neither Dichle or Neumann, we had to struggle and waste time on solving it. You can actually do it and you get the result that you expect. And again, the current is just these current loops, uh, if you want, parallel to the wall. And this is just numerics verifying that everything works okay. And then you just repeat the methods that I've shown a second ago. You do uh, the dilute limit. And what you do is you have random pumps, but now pointing along the wall. So essentially what we had before was that at the microscopic scale, the disorder was steering the fluid. It's acting like small pumps steering the fluid. And here just the wall is steering the fluid. So you could get the same result by an equilibrium experiment with pumps aligned along the wall. And you, uh, and you do the two point, you calculate the two point correlations. It has this Lorentzian structure. And this is again, just uh, checking the two point correlation for the same value of X for different values of Delta Y. And this leads to these tongue structures that grow as you move into the system, but decay uh, in magnitude. And it, this is a quantitative chain check of these results. And you can do the same thing for the current. And again, you find this, uh, this uh, vortices that propagate into the system, spread and grow as you move into the system with a magnitude that goes uh, down. And then you repeat the same method. You write down a field theory and you put down now a random forcing, but the random forcing is now aligned along the wall. So just, if you want, okay, maybe a simpler problem. And, uh, and you put in the simplest linear theory, and you calculate the uh, structure factor and you find out that it, in Q space it has this form, which agrees with the Laurentian that I showed you before uh, for small Q. And uh, sort of interestingly enough, it's not unexpected because things decay as you move into the bulk. This theory is self-consistent. You just do a simple scaling argument. It's self-consistent above one dimension uh, immediately. <clears throat> okay, so now you do, what are the effects of long range order? Again, we have this uh, effective uh, potential. You could do an Imrima for a droplet in the middle uh, of the system. Uh, there's actually a neater way of doing it. We do both in the paper. Uh, this is a method, again, somehow my fonts are too small. This is a method uh, that uh, is stolen from uh, Meran's work in 87. Uh, so what you do is you look at a, a wetting uh, system and you look at the uh, statistics of this interface. And if you get that the roughness of the interface is larger than one, you know that you're in trouble. So what you do is you estimate the contribution from the surface tension. Again, the field theory is linear. It looks like an equilibrium system. So we can steal everything uh, by some mir miracle. And then you look at the contribution to the, uh, free to the free energy, if you want, from the fluctuations of the interface. You do a scaling argument. You find out that the energy of the surface tension scales in this way, the fluctuations from the disorder scale in this way. You balance these two terms and you get this roughness exponent. And you want to check when this roughness exponent is larger than one. And that turns out to be three dimensions. So, uh, so again, the striking result is that you put this order on the wall and you kill the phase transition in the bulk of the system. Okay, so it's a really dramatic uh, effect. And this is, is again, just showing you uh, results. This is a system that's phase separation, phase separated, you introduce this order, you get these clumps. And if you look at the two point correlation, it agrees with the Lorentzian 
if you're far away it agrees with the Laurentian that we wrote before. And this is numerics. You start with a phase separated system and lo and behold, you get these clumps once you introduce this order uh, only along the walls. Okay, so I'm 15 minutes, I'm precisely on time. Uh, so this order steers the system, that's the main message that if you have this order in an active system, don't put a potential, put a forcing. Okay, at least for potential disorder. Other types of disorder, I don't know. I think that's something that should be explored. Okay, uh, this leads to generic long range uh, correlations, again, of a trivial kind. They're not subtle, they're not because of correlations, just these deep wells trapping uh, the particles. Uh, this holds for any dilute active system. So any dilute active system, dry at least, you expect to have these statistics in the disordered uh, phase. Uh, the lower critical dimension for, for MIPS with disorder is four, for bulk disorder, for boundary disorder, it's three. And again, I'm hammering this point that boundaries might be more important than we thought for active systems. And uh, finally, uh, people have sort of hinted to the one dimensional case. We have a, a paper here which discusses one dimensional disorder at length. Uh, there, it's some, somewhat interesting because in one dimension, there's no MIPS. You have finite size clusters, but somehow here, because you have this uh, potential, then uh, you find that the average cluster size with this order grows as square root of the system size because you have these wells which are growing uh, more and more as you increase the system size. So the average cluster size grows with the system size, not linearly like phase separated, but with the square root of that. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the nice talk. Questions? Uh. So if if you have both bulk and uh, boundary disorder, what's the upper critical dimension, lower critical dimension for MIPS? Okay, I don't know. My guess is that it would be still four, but I haven't, it should be easy to work out, but I haven't done it. Okay, that's a good question. More questions? Yeah. Um, so these potentials are relatively big on the, compared to the system size, right? Like what would happen if you just have, you, know, you shrink the potentials and just add a lot of very tiny potentials? Would you eventually- they're, they're not big. Huh? They're, they're not big, they're microscopic, okay? I didn't yeah. hide that, that, I was trying to stress that I'm not hiding, hiding anything of the disorder. Yeah. Okay, so these are small disorder. It's true that the effect is more, most dramatic when roughly the run length is of the length of the correlation length of the potential, because okay. then you have, strong ratchet current, okay? But as long as you generate these ratchet currents, you're good. You'll have to go to larger system size to see these effects. Could you like shrink the potential sufficiently small that it just turns into background noise? Uh, if you shrink it, I don't think you could do that. Okay. No. So uh, if you, so if I understand correctly, the only effect of activity in your field theory comes from the pumps. Right. right. So if I introduce into the into a five four model, if I just introduce a dilute, uh, you know, disorder of pumps, that will also kill the phase transition. So, so the, that's essentially what we're doing. Okay. I just didn't need the five to the fourth term. So okay. It's activity. essentially what we're doing. We write down the simplest field theory you could imagine, and instead of putting a potential, we're putting in pumps. That's the, the our analysis. Disorder. I mean, what is the sample sample to sample fluctuations of rho x rho zero? Are these huge or like a No, it looks like uh, we self-average. They're, they're self-averaging. Yeah. yeah, we. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how. How, how broad is the uh, uh, the broad? How broad is the broadest of the deep wells? It's okay. So for the one-dimensional case, it's square root of L. For the Gaussian potential, Satya should know that. I I should know that. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry. Thank you. Now now I won't sleep on my slide. More questions? Oh. <laughs>
despite uh, despite the fact that your random forces resulting from the pumps are quenched there's a lot of similarity between your problem and mustansir's uh, favorite uh, uh, what's it called a fluctuation dominated phase ordering if you look at the case of a dilute system with things kicking uh, randomly a lot of the analysis in 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 mip in not in in fdpo mustansir can be done by pretending that this background is actually frozen and looking at the aggregation of particles in that background. And there's actually a discussion of this in Mustansir's. And essentially, it's because the time scale associated with the shifting landscape is long. It's got a dynamic exponent. So at zero frequency, it's, I mean, you know, at long length scales, it's, it's almost frozen. Okay. So there's a closer. Uh, I had a, another weird question, which is since you've shown that, let us say, disorder on a submanifold of lower dimension has such an overwhelming effect. Have you thought of looking at disorder on lower than one dimensional, you know, on fractally distributed uh, no. submanifolds? No, that's inter okay. also interesting. No, we haven't thought about that. Uno, brother. Hello. So you are replacing potential by palms, like current. By pumps, yes. Pumps, um, right. So now your potential actually is conservative in your original model. So, but then when you replace by current, I mean, that actually could be due to a non conservative force field. I mean, like, you understand what I'm saying? I'm so, I mean, Carl, it, it may not be Carl free. I mean, potential will. Be. See, I mean, current can, can have loops, but that you cannot replace by a potential. Yeah, okay. So, when so I mean, the, uh, replace by a potential, we do the Helmholtz decomposition. There's this one part that contributes to the current. Remember, I discussed also results for the current. Mm -hmm. There are steady state currents in the system, but the equation for the density doesn't care about that part, okay? Because its divergence is zero. Right. The point of view of the density, it only sees the potential part. Okay, I mean, that's interesting probably. But uh, another point is that, uh, so coming back to the chi-square, so it can be density dependent, right? So, uh, or I mean, does your uh, uh, result, will, uh, I mean, will your result change uh, if you put that or, I mean, that would pro probably correspond to higher density limit or something? That would not change anything. I want to stress these uh, active Brownian particles and active Brownian number particles are deceptively hard to solve exactly with potentials. I mean, some people here uh, tried it. I've tried it. Even in a harmonic potential in two dimensions is a nightmare. I mean, Abhishek has a solution in terms of a sum. Uh, Satya and Gregory, uh, and I might be missing Alberto, were you on it also? David Dean? Okay. Any, anyway, <laughs> the Paris gang has a simple model where you have only four directions of tumbling that can be solved. But it's deceptively hard, and that means that calculating the microscopic force on an object from basics is a really hard problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we know that it's non-zero once you have asymmetry. Okay, we see it in numerics, and also this is just a ratchet effect. I'm not. This is not novel physics. Well, well, no, I mean current fluctuation. I mean, if you really want to calculate from microscopic, I mean, it can have some weird structure. I mean, you don't know. I mean, the density dependent, you can't predict. I mean, offhand. Well, I mean, in equilibrium, you take a good system, that's okay. But active matter, I mean, you just do not know. I mean, so when we solve the clump, right. we solve starting from microscopics, we solve for the phi, far field exactly. And it depends only on, in the far field, only on the force acting on the object, the leading order of the phi, far field. Okay, so there's an integral of the density times the gradient of the potential, which is non-zero, and that controls the far field physics. So you don't care about, I mean, if you care about the numbers, fine, run numerics, get the number. Okay. So in interest of time, the last question. Actually, I was really trying myself to stop asking this question, but because Purnibrita has already asked, so I'm now going to ask it. You are not interested in microscopic force, but I'm very keen about it to, don to know the nature exactly because the reason Purnibrita said I think this force is non-conservative, non-dissipative curl force. And I'll be very interested in knowing the exact nature. I know you are not interested in that. Second thing, you have studied the quenched disorder because of this. However, it seems there will be action-reaction forces 
So dynamics will not be exactly quenched. Like, uh, sorry, these, these disorder will not be exactly quenched and there will be some kind of dynamics. Okay, so, so we looked in, a, in the 2018 paper and the 2020, we showed that these long range density modulations lead to long range interactions between two inclusions or more inclusions inside an active fluid. You could play with it, it's fun. Interactions do not obey action reaction. You can actually uh, pin two objects and get a synchronization transition because of this non-reciprocal action rea reaction. All this is discussed in the 2018 paper. We have not looked at this case, uh, which might be interesting. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the session. Let's thank Yarev and also Kabir.